welcome to the EdTech Podcast, the show about all perspectives on education, innovation and technology in and out of the classroom. My name's Sophie Bailey and I'm the founder and host of the show. Welcome to regular listeners and a special hello to any newbies, especially those from the publishing world. We welcome you all. And don't forget you can subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher or Pocket Cast to get each episode automatically. This week's exciting announcements, you can now leave audio feedback on previous episodes of the podcast by leaving a free voicemail. I'll then pick the best of these in a new feedback feature. Simply go to www.speakpipe.com forward slash the EdTech podcast. No sales pitches, please. Otherwise, knock yourself out. There was lots of positive feedback on episode 53 with Richard Taylor applauding the historical view of ed innovation and the fragrant use of F-bombs. Lovely. For those of you who follow me on Twitter, on Instagram, you will have seen that the EdTech podcast kit box has been found. Hooray! A big shout out to Evelyn Kozareff at Sam Labs for keeping it safe. And finally, if you're heading out to South by Southwest Edu, don't forget you can save yourself $50 as a listener to the EdTech podcast. The unique code is in the show notes. Now on to this week's show on EdTech for Publishers, recorded at Futurebook. We're in conversation with everyone from the bookseller, EdTech Exchange, Oxford University Press, Assembly, the Audio Book Publishers Association, Cortex and many more, asking questions such as, what can EdTech and publishers offer one another? Can two distinct business cultures meet in the middle or not? Is there a short-term cost financially to publishers who are embracing edtech? And outside of content, what are the tech infrastructure considerations on edtech for publishers across data and good connectivity? Noticeably, whilst opportunities exist, there was consensus on the points of financial squeeze in education and some difficult edtech business models. I'm kind of... um going to say that it's no walk in the park. I guess what I really wanted to say is, if it doesn't do something better, there is no point. It's not like we've been looking at textbooks and going, oh, these are dreadful. The next couple of years, I think, are going to be tough in terms of the finance going into uh, edtech in schools. The biggest challenge they've cited over the past three or four years has been the quality of broadband and Wi-Fi in UK schools. A big thank you to the bookseller, Futurebook and EdTech Exchange who worked on the EdTech for Publishers event together. And if you like this episode, you might be tempted to also check out episode 37 on textbooks versus technology. Have a great week, everyone. So first up, let's hear from the author Andrew Keane to get us all going before hearing from co-organisers Philip Jones, who's editor at The Bookseller, and George Burgess at EdTech Exchange and startup Gojimo. You are on the verge, for better or worse, of knowing your consumers intimately. Mostly you've just guessed about them in the past. You don't know why they read, when they read, what they want to read, what they will read, what they have read. And my advice to you as an industry is to wake up to this and understand that finally you can learn what your consumer wants. You cannot do one without the other. Those of you who go for an all digital policy will fail. Those of you who focus purely on the analog, who think you can maintain your 19th or 20th century business models and cultures will fail too. Okay, so the bookseller had had a digital conference since I think the mid um, noughties and then around about 2010, myself and my colleague Sam Missingham uh, rebranded it as Future Book because we wanted to capture that moment that was happening in trade publishing in particular at that time with the Kindle having launched and ebook sales really starting to pick up a pace and accelerate and starting to change the way people thought about trade publishing, commercial publishing, consumer publishing. We wanted to capture it and encapsulate it under a sort of different kind of brand. So we came up with the name of Future Book, which obviously is looking not just to digital, but to all types of future books. And the conference relaunched as that, I think, in, in 2010, maybe 2011. It was, to call in a phrase that someone said to me some years later, it was the kind of bedwetting period <laughs> when everybody thought everything was going to okay. change about yeah. trade publishing. Um, and everybody needed to be there to have that conversation. And it was a very kind of 
fertile pat time because people were exchanging ideas. No one knew what was going to come around the corner. I mean, that's very interesting to kind of uh, look back at that period of change and perhaps think, is that what we're going through now with EdTech and, you know, are people perhaps who didn't experience that first wave of change thinking is this the bedwetting period of, of change with the disruption that edtech might bring to publishers so i mean it'd be quite interesting you're, you're obviously very tapped in with the way publishers think and you know the particular drivers for them at the moment what do you think's their overall perspective on on edtech and its role in publishing well for trade publishing that kind of bedwetting stage is um pretty much over for this kind of first phase but some of the characteristics I th- saw back in 2010, 2011, lots of startups, lots of conversations about possibilities, lots of change in people's kind of working methods, lots of kind of blue sky thinking. I saw the same thing happening in the educational publishing space under the sort of brand name everyone uses of EdTech. Again, lots of startups coming in, lots of opportunity, lots of, I think, um, fear is not quite the not quite the right word but lots of kind of I think disturbance in the force <laughs> publishers educational publishers are I think worried that there will be some change coming down the line that they don't see early enough which will perhaps not wipe out the traditional sort of textbook printed book mm. but will certainly supersede their ability to do that business at scale and so they want to see that coming very early in order to react to it but they're just not sure where it is and that creates a little bit of I think feels again a little bit kind of harem scarum a little bit kind of confused and, and it makes I think the industry very very interesting also a bit defensive there's this sense that they do need to talk to these people on the other side of the fence who want to come in and destabilise the traditional sector. They want to come in and kind of It's like a relate session. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we branded ed, you know, our EdTech conference as EdTech for Publishers because we wanted it to be, in a sense, a safe space for publishers and other people working in the content industry in the educational world to come together with those startups, with the, with the new thinkers, just to share ideas. And also to... I felt with trade publishing, a lot of startups got to a stage where they'd raised funds and invested quite a lot of money without really understanding the way the market worked and the way they could add value. They saw a sort of problem in some cases that didn't really exist and no one was trying to solve. And I think a lot of money got wasted because of that. A lot of those startups have now folded. You know, Some have survived, but a lot have kind of gone away or they've pivoted. Yeah. And I felt that in the edtech space, we could maybe get in there a bit earlier and stop that happening and actually because it's nice for publishing that there is all this money coming into the business it's even nicer if that money is used wisely to help the industry rather than to to try to undermine it I mean there's been some well documented should we say sort of financial struggles in some of the big publishers recently in the sort of discussion around why that's happening is you know it is edtech or is sort of digital innovation part of that discussion or what, what do you see as some of the, the reasons for that drop off? Um, well, I think if you're looking at Pearson, for example, they've clearly taken a big bet on certain things happening around education, around the use of digital resources um, and the globalisation of that. I think they are right to take that bet. I think they maybe could have hedged it a little bit. I think they've been hit by a particular issue in North America, which other educational publishers in higher education have seen, which has nothing really to do with tech, but just to do with the overprice of textbooks and students as ever wanting to um, find the cheapest way of acquiring that content, which has, I think, always been the case. It's just now a bit easier. Uh, via rental services and I think Pearson's having to adjust to that Um, I think all the big educational publishers are investing heavily in innovation and in digital I think rather like many edtech companies they're not seeing a big conversion to those resources yet but it will clearly come because um, digital's going nowhere devices are only going to get cheaper schools are only going to invest more in technology the students coming up uh, who are in primary school now will be again better at using those technology resources than the generation above them so i think publishers are right to look at it but they're also right to you know take a care for their traditional business because 
the academic bookselling market in the UK, for instance, through Waterstones and Blackwells, uh, and many independent booksellers on campuses is still very strong. In some cases, um, doing better than it has been doing. So the traditional printed textbook or educational resource that comes between two covers is still a very vibrant part of their business. And of course, for many publishers, that's the business model that serves them best still. And until that starts to fade away dramatically, which hasn't even happened in trade publishing, even though the Kindle has obviously taken a, a big market share of some commercial fiction, until that market starts to move, then I think they will, as you'd expect, focus on the business that is delivering returns rather than the business that is potentially going to deliver future returns. So in a way, they are you know, striding both sides but there's one bit that's working in terms of income and revenue, whereas the other bit is a bit more speculative, yes. as has been shown by, by Pearson's issues, I think. And so if people are listening and, you know, they may work already in that sort of crossover between EdTech and publishing, how can they contact you or contact the uh, Future Book team to connect? Well, I'm available on the bookseller website, or you can contact me on my email address, which is philip.jones at thebookseller.com. So, George... Congratulations. Sophie. Thank you. Yeah, the inaugural EdTech for Publishers. So this was really spun out of um, a conversation we were having with the bookseller probably 12 months ago. They were finding they were writing more and more about the EdTech sector. Um, and Philip, the editor there, kind of invited me out to a swanky restaurant in King's Cross for breakfast one morning and just kind of floated the idea of running a conference. Um, and that was something that Justin and I at the exchange had been quite keen to do, um, but had always felt we didn't really have the expertise or, you know, incre- you know importantly, the, the bandwidth to actually do ourselves. Um, so it was a very natural and obvious relationship. Um, and I think it's really paid dividends today. What we're seeing is, as I think Kate alluded to, this incredible cross-fertilization and exchange of ideas between startups and publishers, which is exactly what the mission was from the very beginning. And, I mean, if you were to list the top three things that you think that publishers might need and that the edtech uh, world might provide, what would those be? Well, I think number one has to be kind of innovation and related to that is um, almost outsourcing of risk. Um, so if you look at a lot of the stuff that members in the exchange network will be doing, there are a lot riskier ventures and they're very kind of questionable in some respects, both business model and product wise. And these are the sort of things that you know companies of that magnitude and, and of that prestige and age are never going to touch. So, you know, I, I mean, I think about what I do in my day job at Gojimo, we now have an on-demand tuition platform. We have over 200 tutors available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There was no way that Pearson or OUP were ever going to go and build out a freelancing network of tutors. Um, and so, you know, we do hope down the line that we could partner with them on that. Um, and so I think, I think that's probably key is, is they look for innovation, they look to outsource their risk. And then, you know, it really comes down to, you know, what, what can they learn from us and how can, at the end of the day, how can they benefit? So, you know, that might be distribution, which is ironic. We see um, Colin Hughes from Collins say, you know, they now distribute some of their content through Show My Homework. I thought that's probably one of the first times I've heard of a startup being the distributor. Um, but it might also just be licensing out their content for innovative players to make use of. So going back to the, the business culture and the, the disparity between the two, you know, how can uh, we ensure that the innovation side of things is protected if, if, if partnerships or if acquisitions are happening and that kind of thing? There's quite a few uh, acquisitions uh, of ed tech, whether it's um, uh, AI companies or that kind of publishing. You know, if those guys are startups or have their own particular culture, how, how can we ensure that um, within publishing that isn't uh, sort of diluted or, or the, the initial benefit of that acquisition isn't lost? Well, I think that, you know, that mostly comes down to the acquisition strategy. And we heard um, the CEO of Hachette this morning talk in that video interview about the acquisition they've made of an app development company, uh, Neon Play, a game making company. Um, and he was adamant that they would not infringe on the culture that those founders had built. Uh, and I think that's crucial because they have bought them for their creativity, for their insights, for their understanding of that sector. And that only works if you know, they have their, their small kind of um, lean team 
um, and can, I think, behave and work in the way that they're used to. I think if they were thrown in at the deep end of the publishing world, the bureaucracy that comes with that, and I suppose the slow, you know, slower moving pace that the publishing industry um, has, you know, they, they wouldn't be able to achieve what they've set out to achieve with that acquisition. Um, and so I think people who are quite recognize that. I think there are some cases where it's very clear you do want to integrate from day one. Often we see publishers buy um, a platform. In that case, they just want to build everything else they have on top of it. That's a clear need for integration there um, at, at an extreme length. But in that instance, Tim was referring to, you know, again, outsourcing of innovation and in some respects outsourcing of risk, but in a kind of controlled format because they now own that entity. Um, and, and therefore, they are taking measures to ensure that they don't infringe on that startup culture. And from the, your perspective, what do you think would be the top three areas, say, of acquisitions or the areas that we should expect to see collaboration between publishers and edtech? So my next panel is all about that. And I, <laughs> I'll come along. <laughs> Please do come along, <laughs> Sophie. Um, so I, I think when it comes to acquisition right now, um, we've seen some of the bigger players beginning to pause and maybe take note. There's been a lot of acquisitions over the past three, four years in the edtech sector. Um, and in a lot of instances, those haven't necessarily panned out the way people would have hoped. Um, so I think there's a, there's a time of reflection right now. Um, but on the flip side, there's also a time of opportunity because we are seeing venture investment slow down slightly uh, post-Brexit, post-Trump. Uh, with a cool down in the California tech sector, that's all having a domino effect on European tech. Um, and that means rounds are getting smaller, rounds are getting cheaper, and in turn, you know, ed tech companies are potentially cheaper when it comes to acquisition as well. So it's a very interesting dynamic in the sector as a whole. Um, why would publishers look to acquire? And what would they be looking to acquire? Um, I think that depends from publisher to publisher. I know that you know, some are increasingly looking for consumer models. Um, you know, these educational publishers are very traditionally B2B. Mm -hmm. If they want to do consumer, they don't have that expertise, they don't have the products to do so. Um, acquisition there makes a lot of sense. Um, if you talk to a firm like OUP and you look at their acquisitions, they have actually really been content driven to date. Even their kind of technology acquisitions actually have great content at their core. Um, so they have a, perhaps a slightly more traditional take and, on what they look for. So it really varies. I don't think there's any one thing um, but what I can say for sure is that all of these guys are not only looking for traction, they're also looking for proof of revenue. I think UK EdTech in particular is still very traditional. Um, the people running these businesses are, are still quite traditional. Um, and so they will not be picking up companies which are pre-revenue but have great traction. Um, you know, they are looking for companies that have numbers but also are generating revenue, have a proven business model. And I think that's crucial for EdTech founders to understand. And how long do you think it will be before we get to that point <laughs> where there are, you know, a whole handful of, of really strong revenue generating? Well, I mean, we're seeing some already. I think it's a small number, but, you know, Show My Homework has been mentioned many times today. Uh, I think they're, uh, Namish has built a fantastic company there and it's a great example of how you can monetize from day one. Um, Gojimo, my business, is on the complete opposite end of the spectrum where we very intentionally went for growth in the very beginning. And only now that we have a huge user base are we, are we looking to monetize. Um, those are two different approaches. Um, and in some respects, they both have pros and cons depending on how you want to look at them. I think ours is probably a, a riskier uh, move, but has the potential in the long run to really pay off if we can now find that monetization model. Um, but I think what we need to we as founders and we in the exchange need to really appreciate is that there is perhaps more of an emphasis on monetization, particularly for the exits, than people realized. Um, because I think a lot of us were quite naive two, three years ago and were just saying, if we can build great traction, great users, great products, it's valuable to someone. Well, that's not how British publishers see it. Excellent. Well, um, and for those that don't know, how can uh, people follow you on Twitter or get in contact? So I'm on Twitter at Burgess G. Um, or you can follow Gojmo at Gojmo app or EdTech Exchange, which is at EdTech Exchange, I believe. Um, and equally, I can be contacted on email, george at gojmo.co.uk. Always happy to chat to interesting people. Wonderful. Thank you very much, George. Thank you, Sophie. Next, let's hear from some publishers. Tom Hall, who up until last week was VP Technology and Digital at Pearson, and Imogen Paul, Area Sales Manager for Africa and the Caribbean at Oxford University Press. My team um, 
design and build the products that we use in markets like Mexico and Brazil, India and South Africa and Turkey. Um, and it's all about the, the digital tools that enable um, blended teaching models in those uh, markets. For me, it's been a really, really fascinating journey, um, and I, I continue to love that constant change um, and challenge. I'm kind of um, going to say that it's no walk in the park, if you can uh, read that white font. Um, as, aside from all of the hype, with, not hype, but you know, there's a lot of facts about how much money's coming into the ecosystem, and these numbers differ, differ wildly, but I think the last year there was $2 billion went into funding startups in North American EdTech alone. Uh, the, 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 the whole market is valued at around $40 billion this year. I looked at a few different analyst reports, uh, not one of yours, Kate, so I'm not going to misquote you, but I, I looked at various reports to kind of get projections of where everyone thinks the market's going. and. Uh, we're, we're nearly in 2017, and uh, it's sort of 2020 is sometimes held as like the great beyond. But you know, there are projections that the market will be worth anything from 100 billion dollars to 250 billion dollars. Uh, that's pretty wild growth in the next three years. Um, and I think everyone can often kind of get slightly arrested by the big names that um, put their ring in the hat for education investments. I think about. Mark Zuckerberg and his wife Priscilla, and the money that they have put into uh, non-profit in the US and for-profit in the US and beyond, you know, they, they can write checks for $100 million and that can sometimes disappear into the ether, but that's a big amount of money. Um, other big names like Jack Ma and Alibaba, um, he can uh, invest $100 million in a Chinese language platform to teach ELT in China overnight. And that's the kind of thing that gets people's eyeballs and makes people sit up that little bit straighter. So, um, you know, from, from a few steps back, you could think EdTech's flush with money and easy. Well, um, I just kind of wanted to dispel the myth that it is easy. It's definitely fun. Um, so my, my wavy paths here is just to say that it is no walk in the park. Um, and frankly, it's messy. Uh, it can be quite painful for both corporates and startups alike. Um, I break that pain and kind of messiness down into three or four main buckets. Um, my first bucket, I like buckets when I think about things. The first one I would say is kind of pricing and uh, payment models. Um, we're still, I think, as an industry, working out what's going to stick. Um, pricing apps in an education store direct to students or learners is notoriously tricky um, and I think it's unlikely to provide a reliable revenue stream unless you can mix that up with other business models or services through partnerships or sponsorships. Uh, in the institutional world making the jump from textbook pricing to digital services is also really hard. Um, customers, learners want both formats and so there's a a conception that you get two for one um, for a double, a double deliverable. Um, but putting the, that book behind glass and thinking that that provides, you know, a um, an exciting education technology product would also be misguided and not going to do enough. Um, and then you've got, in terms of business models, rentals and subscriptions, uh, different access models really disrupting what publishers once took as a very safe transactional relationship where you'd kind of turn up once a year, drop off your textbooks and come back in 12 months time for you know, the next round. So um, there's the business model challenge and then in that first bucket still I'd say there is just a lot of good free stuff. Um, and a lot of that free stuff is coming from hugely brilliant foundations like Khan but you know, to, for, for a, a, a publisher or a corporate to stand up against that value, you really have to be adding something special to your content or your um, product model. So that's my first bucket, pricing and, and um, uh, uh, business model. I think secondly, the, the ecosystem or market readiness for your technology product, it's too easy, I think, to kind of sit in an ivory tower and, and think with your stickies and your white paper boards and really go to town on how brilliant and uh, sophisticated your products could be. Um, 
But you could put that out there and how the kind of technology ecosystem responds to that product can really, really hurt. So um, any product experience that relies on hardware, connectivity, you know, good working Wi-Fi, it's gonna, it's gonna break your product. The product will be fine, but it's not the, the user experience could be dreadful. And so it's way more uh, unreliable than simply, again, dropping off that textbook once a year. And I think lots of kind of factors way outside of product experience are gonna hurt you. So I, identity management and access tools, um, you really need to lock down those dependencies before you ship something because they're the things that your, your learners are gonna remember as hurting their classroom experience. It has nothing to do with the quality of the content or the pedagogy. Um, some really big companies have put a lot of money into things like hardware because it kind of, you know, would a student in a classroom need a uh, classroom specific tablet? For a while, a lot of people thought that was going to be a way to go. I've written uh, research papers myself in previous roles, sort of asking that question is this something that we should look at? And companies that did have had a really bad time because. Uh, you know, you can't always, as a, as a publisher, you just do not have that um, uh, production cycle to build and ship tablets and take on responsibility for chips or hardware that's going to start smoking in the middle of a uh, science lesson in Ohio. So, you know, I think those factors, again, are going to really hurt how far and how wide you approach EdTech. Um, and just... Yeah, good working Wi-Fi is something that we often in this room, I don't know what it is like in this room today actually, but we take it for granted. Um, it's probably the one thing that's going to be a, uh, a factor in people rating or hating your product. So though that's my second bucket. And, and thirdly, maybe the, the most simple thing is getting your content ready. Um, as publishers, it's very easy to think, you know, we've got loads of images and we've got loads of text and we can just throw it into a digital platform, I still see examples, um, far too many of, of content, and this is in products that I might have a role in building or a role in reviewing from elsewhere, where that is not mobile first content, and it's, it's noticeably um, clear. And I think that is holding publishers back, because it, it really is a differentiator between companies who are starting from scratch. So I wouldn't overestimate how complex and expensive it is to get your content mobile ready. So, um, hopefully I haven't depressed everyone too much. So, I have spent the last couple of years working as an educational consultant for the education division at OUB, um, and that involves sort of extensive travel to um, sub-Saharan Africa to promote our resources to international schools there. So meeting with teachers, meeting with principals, meeting with booksellers, talking to them about our resources, both print and digital, um, and sort of and supporting with training of teachers as well. So we've run a couple of workshops to support with using Oxford resources in the region too. Okay, interesting. I mean, I used to work in the telecom sector and... Um, you know, obviously Africa's a huge continent, but thinking about, um, for example, um, M-Pesa in Kenya, often um, noted as a, uh, a technology which sort of leapfrogged the elements of, of banking and just go straight into the innovation and mobile first and all of that. Do you, do you see any of that in terms of ed tech or um, publishing content in any of the markets that you work within? Or? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting question and something that I've been talking quite a lot about in the um, ed tech stream has been sort of traditional publishers um, working with startups um, and ed tech companies to ensure that content is, is reaching those parts of the world. Um, Currently, we're sort of um, work with more sort of traditional sort of online platforms um, in some of the larger international schools, and that's really where our focus has been. Um, but I think our local branches are very much looking at um, providing local curriculum content for for um, either low cost private schools or for for okay, government schools. So your work at the moment is primarily sort of with more British and American schools in, yes. in across Africa. Yeah. And uh, what what are some of those schools just to give it a bit of context so that you would work with so uh, generally sort of the international school of um a country or a city um and so large schools groups so like brayburn in um in kenya um or the Aga Khan schools groups uh, across east africa and are there any particular trends that you think are you know you've seen as more relevant to that region than 
you know, I think quite a lot of the coverage of EdTech happens to be about Western Europe or North America. And I just wondered, you know, if you were to pinpoint the trends that are relevant to where you work, you know, if there's anything that's slightly different. Um, yeah, I think, well, certainly something that's come up time and time again has been connectivity. So um, ensuring that um, content is accessible sort of for children who um, may be based either in quite out in quite rural areas or at the other end of the spectrum um, children or students who are traveling a lot with their parents are expats um, yeah. and they may spend their holiday holidays um, in a different country to where they go to school then being able to, to easily access um, the work that they need to be doing um, and that's something that's been coming up as well in the stream today. And uh, you mentioned so you also work in the Caribbean which must be an awful uh, pain for you. <laughs> well it's funny um, it's one of those um, one of those things that I think actually obviously as we know sort of working spend a lot of time yeah. in hotels and it's all uh, a bit Alan Partridge really isn't yes, it? Yes yeah. yeah no and actually I was out there uh, last week and it rained quite a lot so uh, this yeah. uh, I don't always come back for the tan um, but uh, yeah no and that's that's a very different sort of side of the business because um, we publish for uh, the local curriculum there so um, working very closely with CXC the the Caribbean exam boards um, and there a lot of our work goes through ministries so we are publishing for 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 the government schools um, okay. which is very different to the work that I'm doing in Africa yeah and then the work that you do is it across all subjects is it you know literacy maths um, or is there any particular specialism that you know you're focused in on at the moment um, well I think in Africa it has very much been primary literacy um, we've sort of with Oxford Reading True we've got some really sort of strong um, brand names that that resonate um, across the continent there um, the Caribbean we dominate very much at secondary so and again that's a very different different space so they're very different conversations that we're having um, in terms of so taking the Caribbean as an, an example ministries asking for content that will go on their tab on the students tablets that sort of thing um, at secondary level is very different to the conversations we're having with teachers um, in the international school sphere um, in Africa where um, it is perhaps more about primary literacy numeracy um, and, and computing that sort of thing okay and well we're at future book 16 so what you know what, what, what was the kind of main driver to come along today oh, there have been loads and loads of really interesting talking points actually um, uh, the tech side of things is, is something that I've taken an active interest in myself. It sort of doesn't necessarily relate to my day-to-day -day job, but actually our customers are coming to, to us and asking us what, what schools are doing in the UK, what the, the lie of the land is here. So really it's for me, for me to sort of research what's going on and what, what people are talking about. So um, some of the key takeaways have been... Um, or for me about partnerships so it's not necessarily publishers who are going to be doing everything it's finding expertise um, from different different fields um, and startups can offer um, really valuable um, insight into to areas that we just don't know about um, and then understanding actually where the value of, of us as, as content providers and, and value added that, that we can give as well interesting yeah so we're not allowed to say publishers anymore no. it's banned it's banned <laughs> Okay, great. And then how can people uh, follow you or contact you? So my Twitter handle is at Imogen Pool. Um, I tweet semi-regularly and as and when I do attend industry events, um, it's always good to, to meet up with people. Um, so yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, Imogen. Thank you. Now let's get an analyst and association view on the EdTech for Publishers opportunity. First, Kate Warlock from Outsell, followed by Caroline Wright, Director General at the British Educational Suppliers Association. So I'm the analyst at Outsell that covers the education space, and that means covering K-12 schools, covering higher education, vocational and professional learning, and areas like um, recruitment and HR management. So I guess years ago they used to be called publishers, but they bulk at that now. You can't call them publishers anymore. So we tend to go with information services and solutions providers, which I guess is where they've morphed into when you add technology into content. Yeah, and although then everyone in the real world is like, what does that mean? <laughs> yes, it is a bit of a vague and fluffy term. Yeah. But you, know, you see information plugged into so many different places now. Um, and I think you know, that was one of the themes that we were trying to touch on this morning was about not just how do publishers deliver their traditional content, and clearly they can do that in a number of different ways using different platforms and media, but how they can use the analytics that emerge 
from delivering that digitally to understand better how their material is being used and to feed that into product development um, and into updating and upgrading and improving their product. So it's really a sort of a two-way flow increasingly. And what were your main... uh facets for those that were winners so that was a start with the winners yeah so we did a report earlier this year I think it came out January time um, looking specifically at the UK ed tech market we've done a similar one in the past for the US um, and really quite a broad trawl of as many uh, ed tech players as we could find so looked at several hundred companies and had a set of criteria which looked for example at their management expertise or their scalability Uh, their cost, whether they had multiple business models or multiple audiences to try to judge how successful they might be. Um, We scored them all according to those criteria and we came out with the top five winners and a bottom five, well we can't call them losers because that would be rude, Um, but you know those that might have more challenges in terms of in terms of succeeding. Um, And really some of the areas where um, the more successful players we saw, um, some of the sort of common characteristics that they had, I guess, were around scale. Um, So one of the examples there was Busu, um, obviously got huge user numbers. um, And also because of that scale, able to tap into one of the other areas that we looked at, which was about having multiple audiences. Um, So they started off by serving consumer language learners, um, who might previously have used something like Rosetta Stone or gone to a Belitz class or something like that, um, you know, looking to learn a language online. But they've recently partnered with McGraw-Hill Education, who made an investment in them, and they now um, are able to serve institutional and B2B audiences as well as that consumer space. So taking one product and being able to morph that and repackage it and repurpose it for different audiences you know, adds greatly to your, to your scalability because you've suddenly massively increased the size of your um, addressable market. And, and for those that were in the struggler category, um, it seemed to be that the main message was, you know, that perhaps they were a bit niche. Uh, niche was certainly a problem. I mean, I think if you're very, very focused on one specific niche and the way in which you've designed the solution makes it difficult to morph that into other niches, that that's a real challenge. Again, though, I think really it comes down to scalability and how you can easily grow that. Um, so one of the examples in the sort of strugglers category was a business called um, Massalit, uh, which I really liked when I looked at it. The product was great. I thought it was a series of um, video interviews with academics that was designed for A-level students to help them get an understanding of the subject that they were looking at. So, you know, able to listen to what experts in their art history field or economics field, whatever it was. The interviews were great, very in-depth. The experts were brilliant. But there was only one or two people running the company and they had to go and interview these people Mm -hmm. individually. And then they had to go to each school to sell them access to those videos. Um, You know, one or two people, you just can't scale it. Even though I thought it was a great concept, just how you turn that into an effective business, I think is really, really difficult. They should get into podcasting. (laughs) Well, there you go. There you go. Uh, Brilliant. And um, so just just finally, because I know we're kind of short of time. um, what are you excited about or what have you seen here that you know inter- piques your interest? Um, well, I think this is quite different to some of the ed tech um, events that I've been to before, which have seemed quite insular. Um, so ed tech has its own little community fighting its, fighting its battles and everyone having similar you know, challenges and issues. Um, but this has been one of the first events where I've really seen a strong crossover between publishers and ed tech. And I think there's a lot that publishers can bring. I'm not going to call them publishers. I think there's a lot that they can bring to the game, though, in terms of aiding that scalability. You know, they have large sales forces. They have technology platforms. They have fabulous content. And combining that with some of the innovation and creativity that the ed tech players bring, I think could be a really potent combination. And it's rare to have seen an event that effectively brings those two together. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Kate. Thank you. The next couple of years, I think, are going to be tough in terms of the finance going into uh, ed tech in schools. And this focus is very much on ICT and um, technology. But even though it's tough, you're still doing better than lots of other sectors. So that's kind of that's a posit- positive-ish um, <laughs> summary for you. Everywhere else, over the last few years, um, technology has bucked the trend. Uh, spend on ed tech um, devices in schools and all the learning platforms has but the trend and carried on in a positive track. So you have kind of bucked the trend, but we are seeing such a tightening and contraction in schools 
that actually even digital is seeing some hard times. We're only actually seeing assessment spend in a positive at the moment, but we'll come on to that. But they're spending less, but the key sort of takeaway here is schools aren't necessarily reducing the volumes of things they're buying. They're perhaps trying to buy cheaper, so more devices but cheaper devices. And they're also continuing to spend more on um, learning platforms and assessment. So that's kind of the overall summary. But then we ask kind of some about se oh, okay, um, secondary schools. If secondary schools had more money than their existing budgets, what would they spend on? So kind of a nice feel good factor. They would spend it on more devices, more broadband on Wi Fi, and more content. And that goes back to the issue we talked about Wi Fi and broadband. We have had the biggest challenge they've cited over the past three or four years has been the quality of broadband and Wi Fi in UK schools. And a couple of years ago, we had more than half of all primary and secondary schools telling us that it wasn't adequate for them to be able to use digital um, resources effectively. We've seen that move up about 10 percentage points, so it's getting better, but there's still more to do. And it doesn't necessarily, there are other, is the rural issues, but we found bizarrely Milton Keynes is a not spot, maybe for lots of different ways, but, but um, also kind of the broadband and Wi Fi. So we've been working to, to try and get that message out there because if you're creating content, doing things that are reliable, you know, you absolutely need um, broadband and Wi Fi, that's an issue that we've been lobbying government on. They really need to come up with a solution in the UK um, that will benefit that. But it seems to be getting um, better more slowly. If their budget's reduced from what they're predicted at the moment, what would they... Um, no, have I gone too far? Yeah, if their budget's <coughs> reduced... Sorry, can I move on to this? Yeah, so... So secondary, if they're... Oh, well, they seem to be muddled up. Right, let me run through. So if this is what they would spend if they had more money. Well, they spend on digital devices and, um, and content in secondary, which is a positive thing. So they would um, spend more on digital content. But if they had less in secondary schools, they would also cut devices, which I think isn't spending less, it's maybe making the devices last longer. So kind of not investing in new um, devices, but just kind of making them last another couple of years and then uh, buying more. So then if we go back to, excuse me, uh, if, primary schools had more money, they would do the same as secondary, but interestingly, they wouldn't invest more in digital content. And I think if you put that into the context of we've had the 2012 curriculum changes, we saw sort of some real good times over the last few years in primary schools with the new curriculum, um, investing in some new resources. So they probably feel at the moment there are other challenges, so they wouldn't necessarily buy more digital content than they were planned at the moment. But if they had less money, they would, um, again, not in the, in the um, digital hardware, and they would also um, not spend on digital content and platforms. But, now going back, uncertainty. In terms of uncertainty, Right, sorry, now I'm going to just get the right slide. It does, it does. Right, bear with me, so I can actually get the right slide for you. Right, right. right. Okay. right. Maintaining investments. This is the good thing. More than half expect to maintain their investments in 1718. So that's good. They might not be happy about the level they're spending anyway, but they're expecting to maintain it. So that's a positive. Now, let me find the next slide, which starts off, shout if you see it, downgrading ICT investments. That's the one. Now, this is a negative one because then we see that actually, quite significantly, <coughs> this year, there is significant pressure on school budgets. So we're seeing kind of lots of them saying primary and secondary, they're going to be downgrading what they're spending at the moment. <coughs> but again, just to put a caveat on, so it's not entirely miserable, it has been from a high spend over the last few years, so it's from a good place. So though there's a worry and it's across the board, and interestingly, part of the reason we see it in education, teachers are the most conservative bunch you'll ever get. So, after kind of the general election, and we've, we've tracked this in all the general elections over the last 20 years, we always see 
a real contraction of spending schools, even though they have their budget set and they know exactly what they're getting. So you see that at the general election. You also see, starting after Brexit, even though schools in the UK, they get their money from the UK government, actually for a moment they just seem to take stock and stop spending for a little while and just see how the land lies. So we are seeing kind of a double contraction over the last 18 months, which is why I think we've seen that this financial year, but next year they're expecting to kind of keep things the same. Right, let me find the right slide now. Okay. So, then... kind of um, improving, they're, they're worried about um, training and they're also worrying about securing their funds to spend on ICT. But there was a slide in here and the wrong slide has been sent across. That's it, that's good. The positive thing is actually if you look at the amount of time that's still being spent on ICT, it's going up. So although we're seeing a contraction in budgets, we're actually seeing a lot of positivity about the way tech is being used in schools. So more than half the time, 56 and 54 percent, that's going up. We're seeing that changing because we're seeing more one-to-one -one use. So in terms of the way schools are treating <coughs> ed tech, technology in the classroom, it's, it's more important. They want to spend on it. Budgets are contracting, but they're still doing better than everywhere else. But it will be a couple of tough years. So that's kind of the UK. So a mixed bag. But then, what I did want to talk about, and I haven't got um, international research to share, but is the trends that are going on internationally. Because the UK, you guys are in such a strong position internationally, because of your track record, because of what you've done over the last four or five years, in terms of de delivering all the really, really high-end digital content for the uh, curriculum change, the world looks at the UK, and that's kind of, it absolutely does. I've been since September, I've been in five or six different international markets at different international education events. All of the education ministers at each of those events are keen to talk to um, edtech publishers, UK publishers, print and digital, but particularly digital, to find out kind of what we've been doing. They've heard so much about our 2012 curriculum change. It was a complete pain while it was happening, but actually we've built on that content so much that different markets around the world actually want to use our ed tech in terms of implementing their own views of international changes. So I think the growth in system change in governments around the world, particular markets, UAE, the Far East. So actually, I think it's use this time, even though it can be a tough enough in the UK, don't be scared into not being ambitious and going internationally, because I think actually if you spread your, um, spread your resources and go and look in different markets, it can actually be um, help you ride the storm. What does this all mean for publishers who are increasingly grappling with data and analytics? Here's BiblioCloud CEO Emma Barnes and Joshua Perry, Director at Assembly, to talk more. So Emma, I know you, uh, we're trying to also save your voice, which is uh, a little bit uh, on, the, on the sad side this uh, week. A little croaky, yes. Hasn't been helped by a virus and also going to see the cure at Wembley last night. Ah, so cool. self-inflicted as well. And how was that? Oh, magnificent. Is it amazing? <laughs> are, you, are you kind of reminiscing all the songs today? Yes, I'm a very old goth. So tell us all about BiblioCloud and why you're here at Future Book. Right. Well, um, not only am I a, an ex-goth, but I'm also an ex-big box retailer. I started my career in... Uh, very large companies um, and then I went to be um, a consultant at Deloitte uh, and all of that was awful and I felt like I was selling my soul so I started a very small publishing company um, over over 15 years ago gosh um, and uh, from that realized that there was a huge opportunity for uh, software to help people run uh, publishing companies uh, it's quite a it's quite an old industry uh, publishing and, and people go into it mainly because they are passionate about books and content and reaching readers not necessarily so that they can be efficient and organized about their administration so BiblioCloud is a back office uh, solution and it's a way for publishers to uh, manage their rights royalties metadata the whole business of publishing 
Okay, and so, you know, thinking about how publishing is innovating or going on that journey of innovating, um, you know, what, what we, I think we're here, we're stood right next to your award, which <laughs> is Digital Leader. So um, can you talk us a little bit about, you know, why you think that was awarded and, you know, the relevance of BiblioCloud as publishers go on this journey as well? Sure. Well, I'll come clean and say I was only highly commended rather than oh, winning. Oh, the wonderful no, Sarah Lloyd uh, went off with the, okay. the top prize. Um, but I, I would like to think that um, the fact that I have taught myself to uh, code uh, stands out a little. I wish it didn't. I wish everybody had achieved a degree of technical literacy that meant that not only can they ideate, but they can create as well. Uh, I feel that the uh, the ability to make our own uh, future is is just as important as as being able to brief external agencies. Uh, publishing has never been particularly good at um, being in charge of its products. We you know we we outsource the printers, we outsource uh, the creation of our content, if you like, to uh, to authors. We work a lot with other people, so we're very good collaborators. But there's a wonderful. Um, aspiration I suppose to uh, to try to do a little more to, to retain expertise uh, in-house and so moving into this new digital age I, I really want to encourage folk to uh, have the skills at their, at, their, at their disposal to be able to make things themselves in-house and I mean and if we think about we have the EdTech for Publishers stream here and I know that isn't necessarily your kind of um, specialism at the moment but how can you see this as applicable to, uh, well, if you think about a sort of academic publishing mm. and that kind of thing, um, the, the two worlds colliding between education and, and ed tech and publishing? Yeah, well, the, there's a couple of things that spring to mind. Uh, many of our clients um, are academic uh, university presses, and there is a very interesting trend at the moment with, uh, with university presses. Um, there was a wonderful conference run by Liverpool University Press last year, um, which is, is going to be run by UCL uh, next year, um, which was one of the more, most creative and inspiring conferences I've been to for a long time because it was talking about this resurgence of, uh, of the, the university press and its role in the world nowadays. Open source is obviously a very important part of that. Um, did I just say open source? I, <laughs> I meant open access. Okay, okay. <laughs> Confla conflating the, the worlds of programming and the, yeah. the world of university press. Is a, um, so, um, so the university presses themselves are in a state of flux and they're, they're grappling with the realities of, of this, this future opportunity very well, I think, and they're coming up with some very enterprising um, ways to tackle that. Um, I think from the educational point of view, similarly, like all publishers, a lot of, uh, a lot of, pub a lot of educational publishers are struggling with the same baseline of competence needed to do the, the in interesting and creative things. So... Time and time again, we talk to publishers who we feel we can help by getting their house in order. You know, the real nuts and bolts of publishing, the royalties, the permissions, the metadata cl clarity and cleanliness and dissemination, um, so that then they can use that as a springboard for, for doing whatever is relevant and interesting and creative um, as we go forward. Interesting. And I suppose if, uh, you know, many people would feel that, that perhaps is, um, is the same with some of the traditional, whether it is the schools or the universities who... You know, they they have they want to focus on actually the process of teaching and learning, and uh, but yeah. they there could be some assistance perhaps with some of the um, the back end to save those people time so they can focus on what they're good at. But yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, that, that's it, isn't it? It's about liberating people mm -hmm. to do the work that matters. It's about freeing up people's time so they can focus on the job in hand, not about cluttering up their lives with endless admin, with with endless disorganisation. We we. That there is no shortage of work to be done so let's not do the boring stuff let's let computers automate that let's deal yeah. with that in an efficient manner and then we are, we are free to, to um, ex explore the reactions and the responses we need to make and take to, to grapple with this modern world um, and that ties in beautifully with what I said about skills development as well that we need the time and the space and the capability the, the skills in our, in our own hands to be able to do and these things And how did you go about uh, teaching yourself to code? 
I bought a wonderful book called um, The Rails Tutorial by a man called Michael Hartle. Um, and I would recommend it to anyone. It's called The Rails Tutorial. He's just recently released a new series of uh, books uh, online. Again, you can get them for, for free. And it's called learnenough.com. It's the Learn Enough series. And you can learn enough about the command line, about Git, which is a, a code repository system. Um, you can learn enough about HTML and CSS and JavaScript to understand the basics so that you can grapple and, and represent yourself well with other digital agents as you, as you come across them. Amazing. And then how can people follow you or get in contact? I'm Has Many Books on Twitter. Um, the company's called BiblioCloud. My uh, publishing company is called Snowbooks. Uh, so Google us and we'll see you there. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Emma. Thank you. Back at Future Book 16. And I'm here with, uh, is it Josh or Joshua? You can call me either, but let's go with Josh. I'm going to go with Josh. Josh Perry, from who's the director uh, at Assembly. And is it really cold outside? Uh, are you asking that because I'm still wearing my coat? Yes. For some colour for listeners. It's somewhat cold outside. Right? Yes. Okay, good. Because we're in the, you know, when, once you get in the conference bubble, there's no determining what the, you know, outside environment's like. So I'm very pleased that Josh has agreed to take part in this interview because um, I think from the perspective of EdTech and, uh, you know, where EdTech's going, data is pretty essential. And I, I had the, um, the analyst earlier in the EdTech session actually mentioned that uh, data was sort of on her uh, hit list of things that EdTech, EdTech companies need to kind of get their head around um, very seriously if they're um, passionate about being um, successful in this space. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about Assembly um, and essentially what it is and, and what you do there as well? Sure. So Assembly came around... Uh, originally in, from ideas that have been bubbling away in a schools network called Arc Schools since before I joined them in 2012. And the core starting premise was it's very hard to use data effectively in schools. Now, anyone who has worked in schools, but frankly in any sector ever, knows that if you master and understand the key data that underpins your organisation, you'll be more effective. And I think, therefore, there was a very keen wish within art schools originally to get data working well for that school's group um, but then more broadly a wish to sort of help the broader sector use data effectively so our starting business plan started with one line which was how do you get schools to use data effectively now when people think of school data they often think of the school mis systems like sims and cmis and scholar pack and so on and there are many great mis out there working with schools to get data um, used effectively, but actually increasingly that's only a proportion of school data. That's a small proportion of, of school data even in some situations. So the assembly vision and the assembly mission was how do we join up all of the systems that a school uses, all of the data sources that a school uses, and then how do we provide analytics to school based off all of that data together. And so we're here at, well, the EdTech for Publishers event and broad, more broadly Future Books. So what brings you here? So I'm here because I'm participating in a panel discussion on big data um, okay. fairly shortly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I think the purpose of the panel is really to help publishers um, who are approaching all forms of the education market, not just schools, understand what are the trends you should be aware of in terms of data and analytics. Um, what are the things that you should be looking to do with your products to help service education? But also, what are the pitfalls and the things you should be wary of? Because like I say, there are many um, false dawns and dangerous trends that should be avoided. So I'm hoping that it'll be a rich discussion about all of those things. And, and just very quickly before uh, you dash off for the panel, so what, what would you say are the false dawns then? What would I say are the false dawns? So I think one of the trends in education we need to be careful of at the moment is looking for the biggest data sets not the best quality data sets um, just to explain what I mean about this and I'll get into something that's quite specific to schools but um, a lot of schools particularly primary schools have formative assessment models that involve measuring teacher judgment so a primary school teacher typically will record whether they think a child has met or not met a certain criteria of curriculum and that's a perfectly sensible approach for an individual teacher to kind of keep track of how they're doing and it maybe makes sense to look at that across a year group my concern about that trend is the more you aggregate that up for example you try and look across year groups within a school mm -hmm. or certainly when you start looking between schools you're aggregating a subjective 
data point. Mm. A teacher judgment is a subjective decision. It may be a well-informed subjective decision. It may be very useful to that individual teacher, but it is not a high quality enough data point to look at 100 schools next to each other or 30 schools next to each other with confidence that you're comparing apples like, and like. apples. And, and I'm not saying that there isn't some validity in taking that kind of approach, but the assembly answer to management analytics and to comparable analytics across multiple schools is to work with standardized assessment providers or people that have really high quality assessments based on questions that are objectively standardized or normalized to the point mm -hmm. where you can make good quality comparisons. Now, those are often smaller data sets because there may be fewer data points involved in the individual school, but they're higher quality. And I think that focus on quality of data, not just quantity, is actually, I'm talking about a schools example, but I think the single most important thing mm. across all of it. Too. Very, very interesting. And how can people follow you or get in contact should they want to? So we are assembly underscore edu on Twitter. I'm at bring more data on Twitter. Those would probably be the best places to start. We also have a blog on the assembly.education website, which we update frequently with our own thoughts, ramblings and musings about <laughs> data generally. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, Josh. Thank you. And finally, let's have a delve into where EdTech is intersecting with publishing. First up, digital and audio from James Gray, CEO of Cortex on Higher Ed. Then Michelle Cobb, Executive Director of the Audio Publishers Association from the US, joined by Ali Murden from Creative Content Limited, followed by Catherine Allen and John Cromie from Lyristic talking about VR in educational publishing. As part of today, I just wanted to focus on the opportunities within the higher ed space and really just run through what we're seeing as some of those. Um, we've got about 400,000 textbooks, but more importantly, and I think it came out very much today, we're operating now on a very much an international basis. So we, we're operating in some 30 different countries around the world now, and we're seeing a major shift and it's starting to gather pace in a transition from print to digital based learning within the HE sector. Um, key partners, I mean, in HE, it really isn't an 80-20 rule, it's more like a 95-5 rule in terms of the top five publishers producing most of the content that is actually used. So Pearson, Wiley, McGraw, Cengage, and Palgrave, Macmillan, they're the top five. But the long tail is huge. And there isn't an academic course that doesn't have a long reading list covering content from multiple different publishers. Um, including things like, you know, journal articles, newspaper articles, etc. So, as part of what we've been doing, has been aggregating all of that course pack type content and all of that supplementary material as well, and enabling access to it and the utilization of it as part and parcel of studies. So, now working on things like links through to Pearson's MyLab product, which is extensively used throughout the world. <coughs> Um, but lots of other uh, assessment type products which are really coming to the fore as well. Really then focusing on learning analytics that sits behind all of that in terms of understanding what's going on and looking at the whole improvement of outcomes area. And within this space it's all about partnerships and integrations. And so that's something that we've really focused on and I'll talk more about that in a minute. But this pace of change um, the UK is actually a really interesting example. There's about 40 odd universities now that we're working on that are delivering digital textbook solutions and part, part, as part and parcel of the course fees. So £9,000 a year in course fees <coughs> is creating an expectation in terms of what am I getting for that. Well, some of these programs, uh, Middlesex is probably a great case in point, are now delivering textbooks to every single uh, student across all years. Um, but plenty of others are now looking, and the interesting mix is between the post-92s and then the red bricks. So even now on the red bricks, they're starting to, at a faculty level, absolutely look at the delivery of textbook content in digital form to students as part of their course fees. But we're seeing that move quite quickly. Oh, hang on. And I'm going to leave that to give more time. Um, all of this, though, fundamentally is being driven by two key factors, cloud and mobility. And all of these components that people have been talking about for ages, adaptive learning, uh, blended learning, e-learning, all of those things, they're all enabled by cloud and mobility. And that's a fundamental shift in terms of how this transformation is taking place. Um, 
And it needs to, because a new approach is required. And if, funny enough, I mean, I think in many respects the school sector is leading in lots of areas, particularly in private schools. But we are now really starting to see that in the HE space, actual entire systems and governments are looking at a completely new way of delivering teaching and learning. And, you know, there are some great facts. Some of these come from the uh, New York Times, but I particularly love this 60% of the top jobs in 2020 haven't been invented. Much of this has to come down to this whole data component that people have been talking about this morning. It is moving at such an astronomical space, and we haven't even really gotten into this whole Internet of Things yet. So it's a key component. Um, <coughs> but also the drive is coming from students. You know, students want access to the learning materials, and from a perspective of equality, who should be paying for that? The student, the institution? Well, some students might be able to afford it, some can't. So we're actually seeing institutions now really take on board some of these components in terms of supplying those materials and actually looking at them, funding it. Now, that's a big shift. I mean, if you take Middlesex, they're spending the thick end of getting up towards a couple of million pounds a year on textbooks. But at the end of the day, that's something that's completely separate from the library budgets that have been the traditional source of income for publishers. Um, the market itself is huge. This is a $15 billion shift. Now, this is just in HE. So you start to multiply that across schools, and you start to see a, a real fundamental change. And it is happening in every single one of these markets, and it's starting to grow at pace. 200 million students affected in HE. I'll come back to this, though. It's, it's, it's one of the things that's actually helping in the UK market in terms of funding. And this is to do with access expenditure. It's about three quarters of a billion pound a year that the UK government makes available to academic institutions from a program around widening participation. But as part and parcel of that, this money is about supporting students through progression and retention through university. The money has to be spent on students. And from an opportunity perspective, what a great source of funding for publishers in terms of presentation of, of looking at how institutions can help fund this textbook provision. Um, a lot of it has been spent in the past on things like fee waivers, but course materials fit into this category really, really quite nicely. Policy. Um, another major change, and this isn't just in the UK, it's happening all over the world, but here TEF um, is absolutely going to drive a change. How do you measure and how do you look at the, in, the interaction between students and their, and their student, the, between students and their academics? <coughs> and TEF starts to set out some policy framework that will actually help drive uh, institutions' desire to understand how students are using learning materials. Um, finally, you know, the traditional textbook as a, as a flat file being delivered on screen um, that has to change. I mean, that, and it is changing very quickly. So, EPUB 3 is a fantastic mechanism in terms of being able to support very rich tagging, which enables books to be re engineered from the ground up for today's modern age. The incorporation of video, the incorporation of audio files, assessment, absolutely key. And you're seeing this now in more and more content coming through where, I mean, here's just an audio file, uh, assessment embedded in the book. An assessment could be delivered separately through an assessment engine or it can be delivered as part and parcel of the book. Uh, being able to change equations and see the results of them in real time. Uh, video embedded in, the, in titles. Um, but actually, what's really quite interesting about that is, and we had some fantastic, beautiful EPUB free books from uh, Elsevier, Health Sciences. You know, beautiful videos and everything else, but they were about a gig a time. <laughs> well, trying to download those for a student in a place where Wi-Fi may not be brilliant isn't exactly a good user experience. So there's still lots of things to overcome, but it is moving quite fast. Hi, I'm Michelle Cobb. I'm from the US, and I'm the executive director of the Audio Publishers Association in the US. Hi there, I'm Ali Muirden. Uh, I co-own a company called Creative Content Limited with uh, the narrator and actress Lorelai King here in the UK. And so I suppose it's the end of the day. We, we've uh, collected together to 
discuss, I suppose, you know, publishing innovation and, and your perspective on that is very much from the, the audio side of things, um, which is very interesting to me as well as someone who's sort of gone into podcasting and there's, uh, I think, overlap. I saw the slides on, uh, you know, your average audiobook consumer and I think there is quite an overlap with what I've seen with um, podcasting as well. So, you know, if we're thinking about education or learning content, w- what do you think is relevant that you've seen? You know, how much of audiobooks is about um, learning, whether that's um, academic or about self-improvement and that kind of thing? Well, I think, first of all, audio is often used as a supplement to curriculums. So if you're studying Shakespeare, there's really a great opportunity to listen to it as you are reading on the page. It's more comprehensible in that for many students. And then additionally, it's really very much part of the literacy cycle. It improves your vocabulary, it improves your comprehension, and it also improves retention. So we're starting to see a recognition of audiobooks being important to beginning learners and then things like English language learners And then people who just don't have enough time, who want to take in more content, can take it in in a really easy format. Then there's plenty of people who are oral learners like me. Mm -hmm. I do much better if I listen to it than if I read it on a page. So it's like also, I suppose, that encompasses workplace learning as well. So, you know, if you're a business professional, I think that's, you know, quite often there's this tradition of people really like plowing through the, uh, the kind of greats in, in business leadership books and that kind of thing. But I think a lot of that now is perhaps people are consuming those if they're on long haul flights. Well, yes, and certainly in the U.S. where a lot of our sales people have to travel so much, uh, there are a number of people and companies that assign listening to a particular sales title as you're traveling around, take in this information that can help you with your job day to day. And I I just had a quick uh, look on your Twitter feed. You've also got, as part of the association, a a literacy initiative. Sure, it's called Sound Learning, and the website is soundlearningapa.org. It has materials, everything from videos to suggested lists and activities to help both parents and teachers and librarians all make audiobooks part of what they're doing on a day-to-day basis. Any more to add on that? Well, it was interesting that you brought up the, the subject of people listening to audiobooks when they're either travelling or particularly on uh, aeroplanes. And my company, Creative Content, we started out by producing short-form content specifically for the airline markets. Uh, what we did was commissioned experts in their fields to produce audios that we were going to specifically target to selling to people like BA and Virgin and, the, and you know United Airlines and people like that through the in-flight entertainment company companies that they use to source content. I've done some work for um, uh, an academic publisher because a lot of the universities these days are um, uh, taking audio content and, and using it uh, to enhance their offering to university students. So in MOOCs and that kind of thing? Yeah, uh, but, but in, in some cases, you know, very straightforward audio as well. Like, for instance, I worked for Macmillan Press. They publish a book called um, The Student Handbook by Stella Cottrell, which is sold in the millions over the years. And it's, it's, it's really just a very... A very useful, very sometimes very basic kind of tips for people going to university on on how to study and things that you might think are blindingly obvious, but actually if you've never been to uni and you 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 don't really know what you're doing, yeah. you need a helping hand. And they actually put all of that on audio, um, and then they they kind of licensed it to universities for them to to, to have it available as an audio for their students. Well, it's interesting because I think on the slides it mentioned earlier that um, perhaps where audio previously may have been associated with an older listener type now it's uh, around the is it 18 to 24 something like that yeah. yeah it's and in the u.s and and uh, north america it's growing in that 25 to 34 age range specifically mm-hmm. uh, and we're doing a lot of initiatives to try and entice people in that 18 to 35 age range to try audiobooks and really understand that as they're getting into working and have to drive and have to do multiple things, they have an opportunity to to learn or be entertained at the same time. From your perspective as well, are the publishers developing audiobooks uh, as standard now uh, across the the main uh, publishers? Absolutely. And the number of titles that they are producing on a week-to-week basis is growing. It's a recognized growth area in publishing, so people are doing more it becomes a cycle of demand. More people realize it's there, they want more titles, they entice their friends to listen. So, you know, we're trying to meet that demand, uh, oftentimes without a lot more staff or support in doing it. And 
technology has helped in becoming more efficient, um, but the amount that publishers are producing between now and five years ago is an amazing difference. In 2011, we produced about 7,000 titles as an industry, and in 2015, it was 36,000. So that's quite a, quite a leap. And are there any studies around retention of information if you're listening as opposed to reading? Absolutely. It does increase comprehension and it increases retention as well. Cool. Well, um, if people want to um, follow what you're doing or get in contact, how can they best go about that? Well, I would encourage anyone to check out soundlearningapa.org and the Audio Publishers Association website itself is audiopub.org. We have our press releases and our statistics going up there all the time. And you can email me at m. Cobb, that's M-C-O-B-B, at audiopub.org. You could contact us on our website, which is creativecontentdigital.com, and also follow us on Twitter or on Facebook as well. So we are um, co-founders of Luristic, which uh, we make educational, immersive media, um, which mainly at the moment is virtual reality. John, you have a history in, in EdTech or in educational uh, gaming apps, yeah, is that right? Yeah, I've got a, a background in app development and um, I used to be um, CTO at a company called TouchPress, which was a, a sort of leader in the early app era. And we focused very much on educational apps, but education with a small e. So we weren't selling into the educational industry per se, but we created apps which really, <clears throat> I mean, our tagline was create apps for curious minds. Okay. And, and when did you launch your company, Catherine, <laughs> together? Well, um, I just um, I, I also worked at Touch Press and had, oh, okay. uh, went freelance last summer, 2015, and uh, got an in-house freelance role at BBC, uh, making a VR documentary called Easterizing Voice of a Rebel, which is a history documentary oh, wow. in virtual reality where you can go back to 1916. And what platform did they host that on afterwards? And what brings you to Future Book 16? Um, we've been creating immersive media for broadcasters, BBC, and we're really interested in looking at what immersive media can do for publishing. Um, since uh, we've uh, had some quite good relationships with publishers, we've worked with publishers quite a bit in the past, uh, we think there's loads of opportunity in the publishing space for um, educational virtual reality and augmented reality experiences. And, and how sort of receptive to this idea do you think the average publisher is that's what we're hoping to find out <laughs> although the first two keynotes of today both of them talked quite a bit about virtual reality and I think they showed that it's more accessible to publishers than they might have thought I think one interesting thing is that if you look at VR currently it's being driven by the entertainment industry by the games industry um, and by the media industry and publishers I think have been a little bit slow off the mark partly because I think they haven't really identified a way in mm -hmm. and also because it hasn't been clear yet whether there is actually a commercial opportunity or whether it's just a, you know, another tech bubble. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, until it goes mainstream, I suppose, there's this sort of period of time to experiment and be ready for people to have headsets, you know, en masse. I think what we're interested in really, though, is, I mean, our, our assumption is that immersive tech like VR and AR is definitely going to go mainstream at some point. Um, it's being driven by the gaming industry at the moment, but there are so many amazing applications that publishers could be involved in. And, and on that front, do you know of any particularly good uh, collaborations using uh, immersive technology for learning? So I'm just thinking about the actual content. BBC Natural History Unit have been doing some really interesting learning VR experiences. And we did one with David Attenborough, which was a, um, a, a, a huge, it was one of the biggest um, dinosaurs that ever walked the planet. And you get to put the headset on and see what it's like to walk with this dinosaur yeah, um, and it's had, I think it's, had, it's millions of, of views on Facebook okay. and YouTube there are also some interesting VR experiences around um, using material from the Mars rover and from the satellites going around planets at the moment and I think that that's the kind of thing that VR comes into its own it allows you to be somewhere you never could be and it allows you to have an experience of presence and do, and do you both have headsets yes 
What, what, Quite which a few. Which one? <laughs> any, any particular favourites? Well, I think my favourite at the moment has to be the, the new Daydream headset from Google. And um, I think it, it's a beautiful um, re- reimagining of what a headset should be. And it, it's, I mean, I sound like a spokesperson for Google, <laughs> but in a way, what they've done is they've taken something that looks very techy and perhaps is a little bit off putting for the average person mm-hmm. and given a, a softer feel and um, made it more, more accessible. And um, it's not obviously the full blown experience that you would get on a dedicated headset but it shows what mobile technology you know how mobile headsets will actually um, it's really the future of mobile headsets for someone listening who has a headset how could they access that content um, that, that's on BBC Taster BBC it's gone on the BBC website gone on BBC Taster and you can look at some really good stuff that the okay. BBC have done it's quite inspiring and if publishers are listening in and they want to get in contact with you, what's the best way to go about that? Probably Twitter. So um, I'm at underscore Catherine Allen. Okay. <laughs> well, at Luristic. Yeah. At Luristic as well. Fantastic. Well, thanks very much, guys, and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>I hope you enjoyed this week's episode and it gave you some varied perspectives on how to think about EdTech for publishers. Here's a bit of real applause from Pobble winning their Pitch Ed Award at EdTech for Publishers for their literacy innovation to celebrate ending this mammoth episode. Please feel free to tweet your feedback to at podcast EdTech or via www.speakpipe.com forward slash the EdTech podcast. The EdTech podcast comes out every week, is usually 30 minutes or so and covers a variety of perspectives from educators to investors to government. So subscribe at iTunes or Pocket Cast to keep listening in. Have a great week.